following is the recorded version of the presentation that was made by a great presenter during the Fall Idiot Quilter Retreat 2022. Um, some of you could not attend the retreat, but you did ask if I would record the presentations for viewing later, and here it is. So I hope you enjoy this. There are three different ones in this series, one by Adam from Adam Sews, one from Chris O'Neill from Sew the Distance, and one from Lynn Reinhardt of Cotton Art Studios. All three present presentations were excellent and very informative, so I hope you enjoy them. Okay, so everybody, I want to introduce you to Lynn Reinhardt, and she's going to talk about quilting appraisals. She is a certified uh, professional quilt appraiser. And well, Lynn, tell us where you're from and give us a little background into your background. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm from the Atlanta, Georgia area, um, and I have been quilting for over 20 years. I did a YouTube show for about five years. Um, my business partner and I, we did the Stitch TV show. It's still online. We're not doing it anymore because she had life and decided to, you know, needed to spend more time with her family and stuff. So I've since rebranded and now I am Cotton Art Studio. So I do that, but I'm also, and I've been a certified quilt appraiser for 10 years. So I thought the discussion you had in the last hour was really interesting. And I think I'm gonna go over some of the stuff she had. Um, I may disagree a little bit with a couple of things she said, but um, definitely agree with a lot of what she said. So anyway, um, I'm not a collector like she is. So I thought that part of that was really interesting, but I do get antique quilts brought to me quite often. So, um, so we're gonna talk about quilt appraisal. The first the thing that I wanna show you is, I wanna show you this quilt on one side, and then I wanna show you a diamond ring on the other side. And I just want you to get those two images in your mind and think about those because we're gonna talk about them towards the end. But um, that quilt is something I made and the diamond ring was an antique ring from my grandmother. And can, Lynn, yeah. can I just interrupt you for a minute? I don't know if you can see this from your side, but what we're seeing is not the slide presentation, but we're seeing like uh, the kind of slide pre presentation, you know, where we, you have your next slide, your notes. Oh yeah, so yeah, and I don't have any notes because I'm not a note person. <laughs> I just talk. <laughs> um, let me see, how can I get that to do it? Can you go up into the display settings? Yeah. And there you go. Yeah, swap. There we are. Yay. <laughs> okay. There you are. Okay, perfect. Oh, I see what it did. It had this picture on my second monitor and I was looking at my yeah. first monitor. Anyway, no worries. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the diamond ring was my grandmother's, and then that's a quilt I made. And it's of two koi fish. Um, for those of you who are tulip pink people, it's all tulip pink fabric from a very old line called Neptune when she was with Moda Fabrics. So why should you get an appraisal? This is something we all ask ourselves. Well, I don't have any quilts that I need to have appraised. Um, and the first thing, the first reason that you would get an insurance, uh, an appraisal is for insurance reasons. So if you look at all the quilts in your house, whether they're old or you just finished them last week, um, they're valuable. Let me just tell you right up front, they're valuable. And those quilts um, would need an insurance appraisal on them. Now, here's why. Um, just like calculate in your little head how many yards of fabric it took you to do that quilt, how much time, how complicated was it, those kinds of things. Um, the second reason you would need an appraisal is a fair market value. Now, this is if you sell your work, like if you're, you know, making quilts and selling it to people. Um, I really rarely do these, and the only time I do them for people is honestly um, for artists. And nine times out of ten, they barely know what their art market is, so they know what their quilts are selling for on an art market. And then the last time you would need, and I'm going to caveat this, like I'm going to give you the United States version of this because I don't know Canadian law on this one, 
there are appraisers in Canada. So you would have to talk to someone about this if you're from that area um, or outside of those two countries. Um, donation, if you're going to donate it. So in the United States, if I donate a quilt to a auction to raise money for, you know, breast cancer awareness or, you know, whatever nonprofit organization, I can only donate the value of the quilt that I didn't um, have any hand in. In other words, I can only donate the cost of materials. If I made this quilt to raise money for breast cancer awareness, I can only donate the cost of materials. I cannot donate the value of my time um, or any of the costs that it took me to make it. So the only thing that I could donate was cost of fabric, cost of you know um, threads, cost of, now this is where it gets a little blurry, but if you have someone else quilt it, then that can be a part of the donation because it wasn't of your time, but you cannot include the cost of your time to, of making that quilt. So I could have $500 in a quilt, but it costs, but the time of it is 40 hours because it takes a long time to make some of these quilts, 40 hours. I can't give myself minimum wage for 40 hours. And then that goes into the donation value. So that can be written off on your taxes, just FYI. Okay, how do I approach value? And this is true of every certified quilter and what they do to approach value. So um, just take this into consideration um, that I approach value through fair market value. It depends on what kind of I'm doing. So fair market value, there's two ways to do it, fair market and reconstruction. For fair market value, this is where the appraisal, the appraiser will find comparable quilts of the same age and style to find value for the price of the quilt. For example, if I have to find value from a 1930s grandmother's flower garden quilt in good condition, I would need to go out and see what those quilts are selling for on the secondary market. Now, I, I usually, this is a presentation where I hold up these quilts, so I don't have pictures of these, but Grandmother's Flower Garden is a pretty common quilt. I would say that if I do an appraisal day, I see a crazy quilt and a Grandmother's Flower Garden nine times out of 10. Those are the two quilts that I see. Now, that's not a, you know, sentimental value. That Grandmother's Flower Garden quilt that I have, that was my grandmother's, you know, those, that's sentimental to me. I only have a few of her quilts. Um, so I can't put that into the cost. It's just, what is it selling for on a secondary market now? And that can be regionally. They can sell different because I thought this was interesting when she was talking about the price that she paid at some of those places, um, Chris paid at some of those places that can be regional differences because there may be more quilts in, you know, Pennsylvania, which is a big quilting area in the States compared to maybe, you know, um, Texas. Could be a completely different antique market um, and the people who collect antiques and the people who are looking for those kinds of things. So I will say that um, that is a regional uh, approach though. I've seen some um, online quilt sales. Please don't use eBay as prices because eBay, either sells them way too high or they're not the average. So I look at average. The other way I approach a value when you bring a quilt to me is reconstruction. Now this is where there's not a quilt that I can compare the price to. Nine times out of 10, this is a brand new quilt. These are the quilts that I see, like I've got a lady coming to me on Monday and she's got a quilt she just finished that she's sending into Paducah. So I'm doing the appraisal before she ships it off. Right, because you don't want a valuable quilt going in the mail that you don't have an appraisal for. Um, so this is where I have to look at every aspect of what it takes to create that quilt. Start with shopping for the fabric, cutting. How long does it take you to cut that quilt out? Um, I've got some quilts that are, 
you know, a New York beauty that it would take me an hour to cut out one block because it's got a hundred pieces in it, right? So like that's time, you have to look at what the quilt is. Piecing, how long does it take you to piece that quilt? If you're doing a nine patch, yeah, that's easy, okay. But if you're doing, you know, any kind of curved piecing like a double wedding ring could be a lot longer time-wise at minimum wage, you know, or more depending on how skilled this is. Um, if you, this is paper pieced, is it hand pieced? Those are the, all the things I have to look at. And then how long does it take you to quilt? What kind of quilting did you do? Is it domestic machine quilting? Is it hand quilting? Is it custom quilting on a long arm that you know can start at $35 an hour um, because it's densely, densely quilted, show quilted? Um, and then what does it cost to put on a binding? And what kind of binding? Are we looking at scalloped borders? Are we looking at straight edge borders? I mean, those are all the things. So how long does it take you to do all this kind of work, right? So compare a nine patch quilt to a pineapple quilt, and there's a big difference in time. So that would be the difference in what I look at and how I approach what is the value of the quilt. Now, this is also important to think about this too. Um, when I started doing this 10 years ago, you could buy fabric for $8 a yard. I don't think you're buying fabric at $8 a yard anymore. In the States, we're buying fabric anywhere between $13 a yard and $16 a yard, um, 12, 50, 16. And that's just for boutiques and prints that's not including you know hand dyes which will start at 24 if you're buying stuff from spoon flower which is at least 24 to 36 dollars a yard depending on what you're looking at are you buying wide backs those are more expensive um so you have to look at how much fabric is now because i have to look at today's cost because i'm reconstructing this today and I have to think about what's the smallest amount of fabric that I'm gonna buy for this quilt. So if you've done a scrap quilt and it's got like a hundred different fabrics in it, which they can, scrap quilts can, the smallest amount of fabric that I'm gonna buy from a fabric store, high quality fabric is gonna be a fat quarter. Well, fat quarters are anywhere from 350 to 450 a, quarter, a fat quarter. I'm not talking about the 99 cent fat quarters you're getting at Walmart, because that's not the same quality of fabric that you've brought me. So I have to think about what you're bringing me, right? Um, and there is a difference. And, and please don't hear what I'm not saying. If, if your pocketbook can afford Walmart fabric and that's the best you have, that's great. And that makes beautiful quilts. What I'm saying is, there's a difference in the finishing techniques of some of the fabrics at your higher, you know, at your quilt stores, then, and that's why they're four fifty a yard or four dollars a fat quarter, not a yard, a fat quarter. So, so reconstruction, fair market. Those are the two things I look at when I'm looking at it. Now, um, I was going to tell you some things to take care of a quilt because she looked at some of those stuff, and I'm just going to run through this really quickly because I want to give you more um, more time to ask me questions because usually a lot of questions come up about appraisals and stuff but don't smoke around quilts that will affect the that will get into the batting and all that kind of stuff and it does change the color of fabrics um, smoking will do that always wash your hands before handling quilts oils and dirt on your hand can get on a quilt now I'm talking some of these quilts that I look at are like antique or vintage, very older quilts. Um, antique, by the way, is a hundred years old or older. Vintage is 30 years or older. So those quilts that they were talking about earlier that she was like, this was made in the eighties. That is now a vintage quilt and has been for 10 years, which makes me sad <laughs> because I'm like, really, 80s? Okay, so 
um, just be, you know, be careful if you're handling older quilts, you want to have clean hands. In fact, I've, I've ran judging rooms and stuff and we don't allow anyone in the judging room without clean hands. We don't even allow them to wear makeup in a judging room. You just don't want anything to get on newer quilts or older quilts, any quilts. Um, always keep them on dry surfaces. Um, keep the quilts in your house, not the basement or attic. You wanna be the temperature and this is Fahrenheit, so it's not Celsius, I'd have to translate that, but 65 to 75. You know, where we live, we want them in the kind of temperature that we live in. No plastic bags, please. Someone asked that question earlier to keep them in plastic bags. No, 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 do not. Um, I don't mind if you put them in a plastic bag and it's raining outside and you've brought it to me to appraise it, then I'm gonna be like, okay, that's fine because you are protecting the quilt, but don't store it in that. Um, keep it out of direct sunlight. And by the way, I did think her tip earlier when she said, don't put it in trash bags was valid. That's very, very valid. A cousin of mine, um, they had Christmas and they put all their Christmas presents in a plastic bag, trash bag, and it got thrown out the next day. All their Christmas presents. I was like, and they had kids. I was like, oh gosh, so sad. Um, yeah, they even called the dump to see if they could go. It was not a good it was a tough day the day after Christmas um so that was a very valid point she made I was like oh um keep out of direct sunlight I know that um you know if you have furniture even in your house next to windows and cloth furniture and you don't have uh sunlight protection on your windows um I've seen couches fade so if you have a quilt on the back of the couch it will it will fade as well um, I will tell you most of the antique or vintage quilts that I see have faded and they've sun faded. And I think we as a culture kind of assume that all of the older quilts are these dirty brown colors. And that is not true. That was not the original colors. You can peek in the, in the uh, seam allowances and see brighter colors. And that's really closer to what they were. Now, that being said, they didn't have this, the, um, the products, the inks weren't as stable as they are today. So you saw more fading because of the stability of the mordants that they use to dye the fabric. So that does fit it in a certain way. So keep it out of direct sunlight. I thought her, um, how she kept the quilt on her bed, those were, that was a fantastic way to keep your quilts. You do wanna refold your quilts every six to eight months and you store them in acid-free paper. There is a, um, what you would do if you've got old or antique quilts, what you do is you would take a, um, one of those acid-free boxes that they store wedding dresses in, that kind of stuff, archival quality. Um, and you would get the acid-free tissue paper and they would, you would wrap the tissue paper into kind of rolls and put them in between each fold and then fold them in the box in a way that it would, um, protect the folds. Um, the, the reason why you want to do that is because cotton has memory. So cotton, if you fold it on the same fold for 30 years, that fold is going to remember that that's there and it doesn't, cotton won't bounce back. It needs to be ironed out. So that will wear, that will be the wear point of your quilt and you'll see where that wants to fold all the time. Now, if it's got wool batting, wool batting doesn't have memory. In other words, what wool batting does or any kind of wool print is it wants to spring out, which if you're making new quilts and you're using wool bat and you want to fake a trapunto look, here's how you do it. For show quilt. You double bat, I do this with a lot of my show quilts. You double bat, so I lay down a cotton bat first and then I'll put a wool bat on top. And then when I quilt it, because a lot of show quilts are densely quilted, when I quilt it um, and I leave the open spaces, that will, the wool will spring that forward and it'll look like it's trapunto without officially being trapunto. So there's a little pro tip for you there. Um, and then another place to take care of them or store them, if nothing else, get a white cotton pillowcase 
and store it in a white pot, cotton pillowcase. That's a great way to store quilts. And I will say I've made tons of quilts for my nieces and nephews that I hope that are worn out, you know, by the time they're done using them. But what I did was I bought extra fabric and that would match the quilt and I made a pillowcase that matched the quilt so that they had a full gift. So they had a pillowcase and then the quilt and then, you know, they just put their own pillow in the pillowcase and then it matches. And I did that to my son. <laughs> you do things for your sisters, right? That's just different. So I gave one to my sister for my nephew and he was a big University of Kentucky fan. So I'd made this University of Kentucky quilt for him and made a pillowcase for him. And then she came back to me and she goes, he has a queen size bed. He needs two pillowcases. So I'm like, okay, all right. So I didn't make enough pillowcase for her. So that may be another pro tip not to get in trouble with your sister. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, labels. Okay, you guys had a lot of questions earlier about labels and I was doing good to keep my mouth shut. Um, but always label your quilts and at least put this information on them. Um, the maker, who made it, who quilted it, the date it was made, if it was passed down from who to who, and don't put mom, put her name, mm -hmm. because we all have moms. So you want to put her name, you know, Marilyn Polk was my mother. She went and quilted, but my grandmother was um, Marietta Du. That was my grandmother's name. And it was given to Marilyn, Marilyn Weaver. That was her name before she was Polk. Um, the reason it was given, it was given for her eighth grade graduation, which was a big deal back in the day. It's not as big a deal today. Um, and any other history, uh, I will say, I use spoon flour to make my labels for my quilts. I've been using them for at least eight years, at least eight years. I haven't had them fade. Um, I don't see a problem with those. The other tip, and I agree with whoever said that the, the, if you print the labels, those will fade because those inks aren't as stable and they weren't, they may be better now, but I haven't done that in a while. But here's what will not fade. And I promise you it won't because it's on quilts from the 1800s and 1700s. India ink. You can go to any art store and find India ink markers and use those markers to write on your muslin or whatever fabric you're using. Um, so India ink has been used in quilts since the 1700s. And you can still see writing on quilts. And where you see it most of the time with the India ink is on Baltimore album quilts because a lot of the Baltimore album quilts, they would, they would make the ships and then they would write underneath the ships or they would write on the wreaths that they were making for who it was. Or like a lot of times you'll see a house and it'll have established in the year that it was established. Um, sign the back of the quilt. I've seen people, especially show people who show quilts a lot, they will sign the inside of the binding so that if it ever is questioned, they can open up a binding and their name's there, so it's there. Um, and also your name on the quilt. Like, I know a lot of times if you're sending uh, quilts to a show, it requires your name, your address, your phone number on the label. So consider those as well. Those can be temporary. That kind of label can be temporary if you don't want that to be a permanent part of the label. But I always put the name of the quilt too on my labels because a lot of times, Unless, especially in the show world, we, we name our quilts. I mean, they're named when they're hung up at shows. So I put that on the name of my quilt as well. But I have a labels printed. I don't know. It depends on how many you make. <laughs> now, oh, I will say this too. I've seen labels used as well for, um, like if you're giving them away to like a charity organization or something like that, um, using labels will uh, be more generic because people who these are given to like defects or something like that um, you don't want a person to be get traced back to you or something um, so they will they will do generic labels of lovingly made for you know you from this quilt guild and so it's just a generic label of who made it but also put the date on it 
Um, and here's the story I want to tell you about that. So uh, I started taking quilt appraisal classes uh, 10 years ago. So I guess it was 2010, because it took me a while before I got certified. So it was probably 2010 when I took my first uh, appraisal classes. And so when you go to the appraisal classes, they're done in Paducah, Kentucky at the AQS show. And um, the kind of the guy who started the appraisal organization within AQS is Gerald Roy. And Gerald Roy is a quilt collector and he has a huge quilt collection. And he and his partner, who's since passed, um, it's called the Pilgrim Roy Collection. Um, I forget his partner's first name, but his last name was Pilgrim and Gerald Roy. And he, um, he has this huge collection. He lives in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And for a long time, um, museums, art museums of that caliber were not looked, did not look as quilts as, uh, as valuable pieces of art. They saw it as woman's work. They saw it as craftsmanship. They did not see it as artwork. Um, so a lot of finer museums don't have quilt collections because they didn't value quilts. So Gerald Roy, um, being the quilt collector that he had, he was contacted by the Boston Museum and asked to, they wanted to see his collection because they wanted to do a special exhibit at the Boston Museum. And uh, Gerald said, that's fine, but you have to come to my house before I will show you the collection. And so the curator of the museum came to Gerald Roy's class. Now, Gerald Roy told us this story in class. So, um, so the, the curator comes to Gerald Roy's class and Gerald Roy says, okay, sit down. I do not want to show you my quilts until I show you what you need to learn before you can see them. So he actually handed the curator two pieces of fabric a needle and thread and said, I want you to hand piece this together. So he literally taught the curator how to hand piece. He goes, this is piecing and this is what I want you to understand. And the guy, the guy did that. And then he handed him another fabric and he taught him how to hand needle turn applique. And so the guy did that. And then he said, now that you've understood that, we can go look at my collection. So the curator had to actually understand the techniques before he would allow him to see so that he would appreciate the difficulty of hand applique and hand piecing kind of stuff. So Gerald, so the guy goes in and they did, there's actually a book published and I think it's called Color. I don't remember the name of the book, but it was documenting this exhibit that was done. And it was called, I think it had something to do with color. It really wasn't as much quilts as color. And so they took several quilts from his collection and they matched them up to modern pieces of artwork and they hung them in the exhibit. And as you walk through the exhibit, you would see this beautiful quilt hanging and then you would see this piece of artwork hanging. And here's why you label your quilts. In that beautiful exhibit that had record numbers of people going through it, a book was published about it. Of the two pieces of artwork that you were forced to look at with a quilt and a piece of artwork, only one did we know who the person who made it was, and it was not the quilter. We as a culture, as a group of people, need to honor ourselves and honor our work. And when we label our quilts, our names will be honored later because we let a huge exhibit go by. And because we didn't think of value what we did as not, we did not see that being honored. And I think it's tragic. I think it's completely tragic that that was a part of us, but we can change that. So label your quote. Yay. <laughs> All right. So clean quilts. All right. She gave you a wet cleaning method. I don't think she gave you enough information on it. So I want to give you some more. If you have an antique quilt, a hundred year old quilt, and it has any kind of fugitive fabric on it. And what I mean by that is it flakes or it's shredded 
do not under any circumstances get that thing wet because what wet does is it weakens the fibers and when it weakens the fibers it will shred more it will flake off more you will destroy it essentially so there is a vacuum cleaning method and the only book that i suggest you get to look at is the it's the aqs guide to quilt care you can download a soft copy of this i think it's like 10 bucks you can download a soft copy of this off of aqs's website i will after the presentation is over i'll go get the link and i'll put it in the chat if you're interested but this goes through both methods of cleaning and taking care of your quilts that kind of stuff so it's really good um, so the vacuum method, you're going to take a vacuum, you're going to have a um, organza or netting, and you're going to lay it on top of the quilt, and then you're going to slowly, you know, put your vacuum down and do up and down technique. Do not do back and forth. That's bad. It's literally put it down, place it, lift it up, put it down, place it, lift it up straight up. Um, if it's very delicate, you're going to have to have a nylon screen over it anyway. The wet cleaning method, and we don't recommend this outside of textile cons conservation, don't wash your quilt if it contains any of these things, deteriorated fabrics, glaze or silk fabrics, woolen yarns or questionable dyes, something that's never been washed. Don't you be the first person to wash it. Um, textile fibers are much, much more fragile when they're wet. Now remember, I'm talking older quilts, like older. Um, you know, vintage quilts, yeah, 1980s quilts, I'd still wash. I've got one upstairs I wash. So, you know, that's different. So I'm talking old, older stuff. Her tree skirt, by the way, was gorgeous. Um, I wouldn't wash that one. I wouldn't have. Um, now, she told you some, here's more, here's more detailed. Uh, very mild detergent, such as ivory liquid or Orvis. Um, Orvis is a is sold at quilt shops as a, as a soap that you can use. Um, I didn't know that other one she was talking about, so I can't recommend it. Um, and an ounce of detergent to a gallon of distilled, distilled, filtered, softened water. If you have hard water in your area, do not use it. It can stain the quilts, especially if you have light creams, that kind of stuff, it can stain them. Um, use a large container enough to accommodate the entire quilt. A bathtub is what we would do. I would never put one in a, in a um, washing machine. Do not, do not agitate the quilt in the water. You're just gonna slowly press it down with the palm of your hand. That's how you're gonna do it with a cellular sponge. Um, remove excess waters by pressing them gently on towels. I wouldn't have hung those quilts up. Um, you are actually putting stress on the quilts when you're doing that. I wouldn't do that. You definitely want to lift the quilt with a towel or a sling, and you would want to lay it flat to dry. Um, now, I'm going to tell you all this, and I'm going to still say this. It's your quilt. <laughs> you have bought it, paid for it, or made it, and you get to do with what you want to with it. I'm just trying to give you the archaeological protection way of washing it. So, you know, displaying a quilt, no direct sunlight, keep it away from heat and water sources. So you don't want it next to the vent. Um, it will not be, not be accessible to pets. Don't tack or nail it to the wall to put big holes in it. If you do have quilts hanging up, be sure and rest them, rotate them around. Um, now, let me say this too. I have what I call couch quilts and I make them for the couch. And I have two Saluki dogs that are my children. And when I sit on my couch, those Salukis sit next to me and we snuggle together and they're on my quilts. But you know what? I made the quilt for that purpose. So I'm okay with that quilt, but I'm also a show quilter. So I have certain quilts that go to shows and those hang up on the wall. And those Salukis never touch those quilts because they're not allowed to. So like, I always take this into account in that there are some things that, you know, when you make a quilt for your grandchild, by goodness, don't you want those grandchild to just use that thing up? Because you made it for them. And babies are leaky and they make lots of messes from lots of different places. 
and it's going to be washed a lot and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So there are those type of quilts that are made also. And if that's the kind of quilt maker you are and you're not making show quilts, then that's perfectly fine. So, you know, let all your cats and dogs on all the quilts in your house, if that's your thing. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm just trying to present from a uh, historical perspective or an, you know, and I will tell you that 90% of my quilts are labeled, but there are a few that aren't because I forgot or it's a couch quilt. Nobody's going to use it but me. So and it's got minky on the back. So it's very snuggly. All right. So I've said all of that <laughs> to say what I want you to know is that appraisals are just not for old quilts. They're not. Because what we do is valuable and it should be treasured. And I will tell you that that ring that I had you look at earlier is worth less than that quilt that when it was appraised. That ring was stolen from a jewelry store and I never got to have it. But I had an appraisal on it and I got the insurance value out of it. That quilt I sold. Now, the ring was very sentimental to me and it makes me cry every time I do this silly presentation because I think about it. But that quilt was just as valuable and I didn't have an appraisal on it. I was smart enough when I sold it, what I sold it for was good money. But I just want us to realize that just because we are, you just have to realize that when you're creating a quilt, what you're doing is valuable. Your time's valuable and what you're creating is artwork. And when you bring a show quilt to me or any kind of quilt to me, I have appraised some quilts and I'm not the only appraisal out there, appraiser out there, but I appraise new quilts as much as I appraise old quilts and new quilts appraise as much, if not more than some of the old quilts because some of the prices that your previous Chris said that she paid for quilts is true. Some of the older quilts um, you can get for a lot less money because one, you go to a, a yard sale and people don't know what they have. Now that's not what I base my appraisals on. I base appraisals on educated buyers and educated sellers. So if you're going to a yard sale and you get a quilt for $10, I can't take that sale as as a valid sale it has to be you have to think about it like um, when I'm looking at an old quilt I have to think about it like uh, um, real estate right so real estate I look at location 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 in quilts I look at condition 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 how old's this quilt is it um, good shape what pattern is it? Is that pattern popular? Is that pattern, is that style popular? The most popular color combination um, of all time, of all time is blue and white. Blue and white quilts sell. Blue and white quilts are valuable. They're much more valuable than pink and white quilts are because pink and whites are still not used to, I also have to look at market. So like interior decorating is still using blue and white today, like they did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago. Um, pink and white are not, not necessarily used in interior decorating as much, unless you're looking at little girl rooms, right? And that's even changed, that's changed too. So um, that's all trendy kind of stuff. So you look, at, you look at condition, you look at age, you look at the pattern. Um, you know, double wedding ring quilts are really popular. They'll be popular forever. If you've been a quilter for very long or people just find out you're a quilter, the first thing that, one of the first things people ask for is, will you do a double wedding ring quilt for me? And if you've been a quilter very long, you're like, no, I don't love you that much <laughs> <laughs> because they're hard. <laughs> so anyway, all right. So just want you to label your quilts and value what you do. And that I believe is it. So, do you have any questions? I know you guys talked a little bit about some other stuff. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, but I just wanted to answer any kind of, I know there's always a lot of questions about. Yeah. Can we, can we uh, stop sharing the screen and get to you? Yes. That, that would be good. As soon as I can get, oh. 
it won't let me go big anymore. <laughs> go big or go home. Yeah, man, <laughs> I can probably do it for you. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yay. All right. And I'm just looking for you so I can spotlight you. So you must be on the second page. I may be. And where are you? Where are you? Where are you? You're there. At the end. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. There we are. Great. So anybody have any questions for Lynn? I have a few questions that are in the comment section that I, I will ask. We'll just see if anybody has something right now they want to ask. I this is I have good. two questions. This is Amy C. Sure. Um, my first question is, is I was handed down a quilt from my mother that was made by my grandmother, great grandmother, great, great, great grandmother, et cetera, for an eighth grade graduation. Um, <laughs> I also have a photograph of all of the women that made it. Oh, wow. Would you have that photograph put on a fabric and put it on the back of the quilt. Absolutely. If I had the okay. capability of doing that, I definitely would. Yeah. Okay. And if you do that and then take it to an appraiser, they'll love you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just wondered if I should do that. It was made in um, Lincoln, Nebraska. How cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And then my other question is, um, as far as appraisals are concerned is should you like I made a wedding quilt for my nephew when he got married and should would you have that appraised and give that to them with the quilt yes yeah okay. in fact I have friends that that's what they do um uh they are you know they realize how much time and energy they put into a quilt and they want the people who they're giving it to not for it not to end up as the you know the quilt under the car which is the and y'all that happens let me just tell you how much that happens i am on the board of a quilt museum here in georgia literally literally a lady walked into the museum handed us this trash bag had a quilt in it she said this was under the car i don't know if you don't want it i'm gonna throw it away Y'all, it was a broader per se quilt from 1760. Oh, wow. Worth thousands of dollars. It was under the car. Had she not brought that in, I mean, we would have lost, there are museums in our country that don't have that kind of quilt because it's that rare. A broader per se quilt, if you don't know, is where they took chintz and they would take chintz and you're talking from the 1700s. So like a little piece of fabric was worth a lot of money. So what they did is that little piece of fabric, they would cut out the motifs. So this one had a lot of ferns in it. So they would cut out these ferns and then they would spread them out over the big um, background and they would applique them down essentially. And that would make their quilt. And then they would quilt it and that would make their quilt. So you were talking about 1760, y'all. Incredible. So yeah, label it and yeah, people will do that. There's a question here from Tracy uh, in the chat. She says, is there a special way to fold the quilts as well as using asset-free paper? Yeah, there is. Do not fold them on the same folding lines that they've been folded on. That's how. And what they do a lot of times, if you think about a square, they would fold the corners in and then they would fold it in to make it a smaller space. So that's not a normal way you and I would do it. We would take corner to corner and fold it together. They're folding the corners in to not quite the middle. Think about folding in thirds. Um, if you're interested, this book is shows you exactly how to fold that in different ways. Um, in folding quilts and then you would put the rolls of tissue paper you know in between each fold that you can see the corners are folded in not normally see what I'm saying yeah, so, yeah there's a way to do it okay and uh, people have been saying here that they uh, fi fiber Castell pit make Indian ink pens yes 
and Indian ink on muslin or better quality fabric? I guess they're asking, can you put it on muslin or? I actually use those pens a lot of times. Yes, you can put it on muslin. I use those pens a lot of times for my artwork on fabric. So I will do these little, like just design, this is all India ink and it's on muslin. So yep. you can get variety of colors. Um, so I will sit and just draw these little things. And then I take these, cause I'm crazy. Um, and I'll put them in like into postcards and then I'll send them out to people and stuff like that. But yes, you can use India ink on muslin. You can also use it on finer, you know, our better fabric as well. Just whatever you want to use as your label. And I'm just looking here. Someone says this may be a strange question, but has anyone put antique quilts in their ancestry profiles to assist future generations? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, I don't, you know, that's a good question. I know a lot of times I will see in the quilt appraisal world, I got to tell you guys about the best I wonder if I could share that. I'll look for it in a second. But um, I, I, I have seen a lot of pictures, like antique pictures, where people are sitting in front of a quilt right behind them. Um, and I think that was kind of common to take pictures. And I think I've seen them on some genealogy stuff. I'm not into genealogy. Um, my cousin is. And so I, I have two cousins that are. And so I've kind of lived off them. <laughs> in the genealogy world um and read some of the stuff so but i don't see why you couldn't um you know it is a part of our history it is very much i think and i don't know i think i i really liked your other presenter and how she talked about how she was rescuing them and i and i will wade in on the comment on whether you should cut them up or not um you should do it if it's your quilt and you love it and, and let me give you permission to do that. That was actually a question on my test to be a certified appraiser. And they don't want us ever making res recommendations because it's these people's quilts and they need to do what they want to with them. I, I kind of look at it like this. So in 1930s, when we were making feed sack quilts from the feed sacks of, you know, the chicken feed or the flour or the rice or whatever we were buying, and we were making dresses out of those feed sack quilts, our feed sack bags. And then when the dress wore out, we made the little girl's dress. And when the little girl's dress wore out, we made the apron. And when the apron wore out, we made the underwear. You know, I mean, it went through a variety of stages prior to ever making it to the quilt um, because it didn't get it into the scrap bag until it went through all of those other things first. And then a hole was in the dress or, and then that had to be cut down to the little girl's dress or whatever. So I kind of feel like you're honoring that tradition by cutting up a quilt if it's got the hole in it. And that's the only part that's salvageable. You know, when you're making it into the stocking she, she showed you, I'm like, she's now cherished something that unfortunately got destroyed and was not usable in the hole that it was then let's break it down and and i look at it this way too if there's like people have brought to me quilts and they'll have a hole you know as big as your arm through it and and i'm like i won't even appraise them because i can't put a value on it that justified the cost that i'm going to charge you to appraise a quilt so i truly think that you know if you're going to find a way that you can cut that piece up and there are 10 grandkids and everybody gets a piece of grandmother's quilt that you've now framed and labeled and told what it was, you know, that becomes more valuable. Um, and now there's this piece that my grand great grandchild has of my quilt. So if there's a quilt that you have that, you know, you want to cut up, I mean, Go for it. Cut it up. Yep. So that's my opinion. And, and I agree with whoever said too. Not every quilt, uh, you know, belongs in a museum. That's true as well. Yeah, true. So you've touched on this a little bit. So if you take a quilt to a professional appraiser, what can you expect in the, in a ballpark? What would, could you expect to pay for having that quilt appraised? Um, I know people charge anywhere from seventy five to one hundred twenty five dollars. I'm kind of in the middle. If you brought it to me, I charge you eighty. 
Um, but that's what's in my market. Um, and it depends on where you are. Uh, but I know that that's kind of everybody. Yeah, that's kind of where everybody is right now. But because you're your own business, you set your own prices. Right. Um, just like long arm quilters set their own prices for how much they charge for square inch or hour or whatever. Yeah. How, how long would it uh, approximately, I mean, this may be a difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. How long would it take you to appraise a quilt? Oh, it's like 30 minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes. Uh, you bring the quilt to me. Um, we talk about it. You fill out some paperwork, which is mostly your name and address and what you know about the quilt. Um, and then I start documenting it. I measure it. I take some pictures of it. Um, and then I spend time talking to you about what I can tell you about the quilt from the standpoint of like, I'll point out interesting fabrics in it that I know what they are and maybe when they were made and when those colors were popular, that kind of stuff. Also about the pattern, um, you know, and like history, historically when this type of quilt was made, like if I'm looking at a crazy quilt, I know that it was made in the 1900s and any time between 1890 and 1910, that was the, um, that was the forefront of when you saw crazy quilts made. So when she said, when Chris said earlier, hers was 1940, but she said her parents talked about when it was made, then I would honor that 1940. <clears throat> and she's right. You look at the newest fabric in it or the pattern. Okay. And so to get trained to become a quilt appraiser, is that a long, arduous sort of thing? A lot of courses? How Can you do that online? What's... I don't know that you can do it online. Um, I did it. You have to go to Paducah. That's where they were teaching the classes at the Paducah AQS show, which is in the spring. Um, and you take the classes and then you need to, they, the way they do it is you kind of need to find a mentor. So find someone local in your area that you can go and shadow for a couple of days. If you live in the Georgia area or you want to come down here um, and I know I've got a show, you want when I've got a lot of stuff going, um, please I, contact me. I'd, I'm more than welcome to help you. Um, but then you then you put your name out there and you start appraising quilts, right? And they teach you kind of how to do that in the class. And then you do that for a couple of years. And then after you've appraised enough quilts, you apply to AQS and say, I've appraised a lot of quilts now. Can I take the test? And they turned me down the first year and I had to reapply the second year. And I went back and took the class again. And this was my um, technique. So I appraised a bunch of quilts. I belong to a guild. The guild was so super supportive. They let me praise at the show. And we had a big show. We've got like 350 quilts hanging at a show every other year. And so I was the appraiser there. And I, you know, people in the guild would bring me quilts. So I appraised a ton of new quilts and some old quilts. And um, so then after that, what I did was um, I didn't get, they want you to have at least 40 appraisals under your belt a year, hmm. uh, which is a lot. Um, so I, I applied, they turned me down. So then I went and took the class again, because I knew the people teaching the class were the ones who were approving whether they were going to take you as a, to test or not. And in the class, I was like, I know, I know. I was literally like answering every question that they, because I was like, I want you to know that I know my stuff. Um, and so I applied again and they accepted me the next year and I passed the test, but it is a written test. They took us to a hotel room and a, you know, meeting room, conference room, and they gave us a, you know, one of those college notebooks and you had to write, they gave you the test. You had to praise a quilt in the class. And then they gave you an oral exam the next day, which you had 30 minutes, 30 minutes to appraise, verbally appraise four or five quilts. I don't remember, it was four or five. And you had a three panel jury. Um, so that was intimidating to a lot of people, but uh, yeah, that's kind of the process. And then they you know, send you the paperwork and say, hey, you're done. But you do have to keep your appraisal certification up. So every three years I have to send in documentation of here's quilts that I've appraised, here's what I've appraised them for, here's, you know, so they really keep, I just sent it in this year, so. Wow. 
that does sound like quite the task. So if you're going to do this, you're going to have to be serious. Oh, yeah, it's I felt like I have a master's degree and I felt like I got my doctorate in quilts. Yeah, it sounds like it. It does. Yeah, because yeah. you're really studying fabrics. And that book she showed you, that's one of the big books that anybody who's interested in get. There's two of them. Um, and they're different date time dated of fabrics. One's older and then they're one's um, newer fabrics. Uh, those are the two books that are awesome. I would get those. Get Barbara Brackman's book on um, the patterns because they're, you know, like you know very well, like there are some blocks that have got 10 different names of them. Mm -hmm. um, and it regionally and geographically is what they were called. Um, the Bethlehem Star, which she called a Lone Star, was originally called the Bethlehem Star until Texas got a hold of it. And then Texas said, no, it's the Lone Star, and everybody believed them. <laughs> but before that, it was called the Bethlehem Star, and it was in the Northeast. Yeah. So. That's great. Okay, so does anybody else have any more questions for Lynn before we uh, wrap up her presentation? Well, Can I tell you, uh, go ahead and ask me a question, but I do want to tell you one more story. Oh, uh, Lynn, it's completely unrelated to quilting, but it's completely related to you. How do you feel about that Tennessee Alabama game? Oh my gosh, look, I got my shirt on, baby. <laughs> I know, right? Right. <laughs> I had a question that I posted yeah. in the comments just now, but have you ever had a, a quilt you couldn't appraise? Because I had a family quilt that I took to two appraisers and a quilt museum, and they couldn't appraise it because it wasn't made in this country. Huh. Um, no, I've not yeah. seen that. Uh, the only quilt I will not appraise and I ethically, you have to sign an ethics thing to be a certified appraiser too, is I will not appraise, in a, I will not appraise a quilt that I cannot value for $250 or more and charge you $80 for it. So like if I'm looking at the quilt and I know it's only going to be worth $100, like it's a quilt top. Quilt tops are usually in fantastic fantastic um why did the position, position. yeah they're in they look so great because they were never used but those don't sell for over a hundred dollars in my area so you can bring those to me but i will not charge you for an appraisal for them because and i won't appraise them because like i can't i can't put a 250 dollar price tag on it or more so i definitely mm -hmm. you know don't do that so I did the, and you didn't ask me this question, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the most unique quilt I've ever seen was a couple years ago. And I was up in North Georgia and this lady brought in a suitcase into my room that I was appraising in. And I said to her, I was with somebody else. So I said to her, I said, you can just leave that here and go look around at the show. And I'll just, you know, we'll finish up in here and you can come back. And she said, no, no, no. I do not leave this. And I was like, okay, like <laughs> I'll just try to help you out. Okay, whatever. So then she waits outside in the hall and she comes in when the other lady was done. And we, she goes, I want you to see this quilt. And I was like, all right, like this has got to be fantastic. It was, it was incredible. So she, she gets out this quilt and it's wool on both sides, wool on both sides. And she starts telling me the story. So this quilt was um, found at a museum that was going, it, it, did, it lost its funding. So it was selling off all of its holdings. And this quilt was there. And this quilt was made by Civil War soldiers on both sides that were recovering in hospitals. And they had this program at the time that they were teaching these men how to sew and what they used was their uniforms. So they literally cut up the uniforms from the Union and the Confederate side and this quilt was made out of all of those uniforms. And it was the heaviest quilt I've ever seen. It was probably king size, it was probably 100 by 100. Um, and it was incredible. It was, it was just, it was one of the most incredible quilts I've ever seen. And 
I had to do so much research on that one because I had to get in contact with um, antiquities dealers that dealt in Civil War history and verify, but she had the documentation from the museum. It was totally legit. But remember when I was talking about, you have to look at different markets. So you got a quilt market, you got a Civil War historical market, you've got a, you've got a military um, medical market, military market. So that quilt was worth a ton. And I can never tell you what stuff I praises for because that's unethical. Um, but that war quilt was worth a ton because of how many different collectors would be interested in owning that piece of um, history, really. It was, it was one of the most unique quilts I've ever seen. Well, and my favorite one. Why is it unethical to, to say what you've appraised a quilt for? Because I am entering a contract with this person in front of me, and I'm not gonna share your financial information Oh, okay. Someone else. I get it. Yep. And so I just don't, and, and you, that is a part of the ethical contract that you sign when you're an appraiser. Um, but yeah, it's just not, so I'm very cautious about, like, I never share how much stuff is. Now, if it's my quilts, you know, like I've had, and I can't appraise my own quilts, unethical for me to appraise my own quilts that I made. Right. Like, for example, the quilt guild that I'm in, they know to not ask me to work on the raffle quilt because they want me to appraise the raffle quilt. So I can't have done anything with it because I have to look at it like I didn't do anything. Um, so I, I don't work on raffle quilts for my guild. I know, and I would too, but yeah. You know. Yep, I see what you mean about that. So uh, does anybody have any last questions for Lynn? Where can people find you? And can you tell us a little bit about your website and about your YouTube channel? Yeah, so I'm on Cotton Art Studio on YouTube, on Instagram. The website's Cotton Art Studio, all one word, dot com. Um, I'm doing right now on, um, I, I probably am, somebody just asked, where are you going to Quilt Co or do you mean um, Quilt Con? Yes, I will be there. I'm not in official, I'm just going to go. Um, I do. Uh, I'm having right now I'm doing a crayon color challenge. I love color. So I'm pulling Crayolas out of a box and then we're looking at different fabric that goes with that color. Um, I'm also teaching a block of the month. I think we're in block. I think Monday is going to be block 10, 10, maybe 10. I don't know. I have to look it up. I'm going to film that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so we're doing that, but you can go back and look at all the other blocks um, that are already posted and out there. And the you can the links in the description below all that if you want the pattern. Um, and I'm actually secretly I'm working with CNT Publishing right now on a class that'll come out soon. Okay, so lots. So I had of to take everything down. <laughs> you can't see it, but that's what I'm working on right now. And so I'm working with CNT um, to do some classes for them. Okay, that sounds great. So yeah. I want to thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, this was absolutely fascinating because I think we all have a real interest in knowing what our quilts and other quilts we may find are worth because, you know, you get somebody to call you up and says, hey, I'd love that quilt. Would you make me one? And then and they say they'll pay you for it. And you're not really sure if you're underselling yourself or not, you know, because we know how much time and labor and and sweat and tears and everything it goes into them so yeah and if you think like 15 dollars is the you know minimum wage in the states a lot of places um that's 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 not i'm not minimum wage like 90 percent of the people out there can't curve peace i can yep. you know and and so there's you know what are you worth and how much an hour and and I think when you start breaking stuff down, you're you're in the thousands when you're looking at some of these newer quilts. Like I've got I've got some quilts that I know should appraise for six or eight thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, you know what I tell them? I just say you can't afford me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So be thankful if I give it to you as a gift. 
yeah. right. you have to get to know a quilter really well and let them love you and then they'll that's get right you. yep so well thank you so much again for this this was absolutely wonderful i'm so glad you're able to come to this i know everybody got a lot of information fantastic information from this and they're saying that in the comments as well so uh, you're welcome to hang around as long as you want, or if you have to go, you have to go. That is fine and dandy. But once again, thank you so much, Lynn. Well, thank you all for having me. I do have to go. I will try to find that link and put it in the comments before I do of that book if you're interested, um, just because it is it is the best book that for taking care of your clients. So, okay. well, thank you so much.